Um, I will spend a little time at the end of the talk about the other things that my colleagues and I do. Um, I work in Rwanda, I work in Kenya with engineers about borders. Uh, all of the work that we do to try to make things portable, lightweight, efficient, um, that goes for basically making cook stoves and drying fruit and uh, sanitation and fresh water. Um, one of our two of our astronauts uh, actually were involved in a landmark technical advance that has brought fresh water to most of Eastern Africa, and they did it through the most amazing combination of the technical work provided by engineers without borders and an amazing approach to the United Nations that was able to fund this thing and make money for everyone and still create fresh water for most of Eastern Africa. And that's what happens when you get a lot of creative people working on the hardest possible problems we can find and then say, now, how many people can we help with what we've learned along the way about improving technology? And so I'll talk a little bit about engineers without borders at the end, some of the work that our chapter at the Johnson Space Center has been able to accomplish and do things we're working on. Um, um, of all the things I've done in my career, it's this work in the developing world that has actually been the most rewarding. I have loved every bit of the space business, but when I'm building a better world, I want to start with the one I live in. So uh, we may get a chance to talk about that. Uh, we live in space, uh, and there is so much of it to explore. Uh, we're out here, somewhere out of here, a tiny little star, one of 100 billion in our galaxy. Our galaxy is one of hundreds of billions. There are more, more stars in our galaxy than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of Earth. Um, my office mate, Dr. Susan Lederer, just three years ago, helped to discover the seven planets around the Trappist-1 star. Um, all seven are Earth life. Four of them are in the habitable zone. She single-handedly doubled the number of Earth life planets that we know of. Um, and so it's fun to be part of an intelligent community making strides in every possible corner. As an integrator, I get to sort of, you know, sort of inside see what all these folks are doing. And every now and then I get a chance to contribute. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about why we go to space, uh, what it is that we accomplish there, why all these nations would want to try to build a space station together instead of going alone. Uh, but I want to start with my grandmother, that's Grace Elizabeth Dunlap, uh, Phi Beta Kappa, master's degree, UND in 1920. And her sorority sister, uh, Pearl Young, is, you have a scholarship name for her city back here as a recipient of that. Caitlin, uh, Caitlin uh, is writing her doctoral thesis on Pearl Young's career. Um, these two women helped establish the agency I work in now. And so UND is part and parcel of our lifeblood. Uh, you were there to help found it. We are impressed with everything that you're doing in your space activities here. Um, it, you'll be part of the future. You've been part of the past, part of the present, part of the future. Uh, so I encourage you to you know, find something you like in this talk and go pursue it because you'll be part of it. Um, and that's my grandfather next to her. Uh, he was the eighth employee at the NACA. He was the original aeronautical engineer. The first time the title had actually been coined. He was hired to run the wind tunnels at age 23. Um, he was hired away from the aircraft company of which he was already chief engineer. Um, and he ran a world-class uh, wind tunnel facility that somebody else had designed. Um, he ran it for several years. And amongst the other things that he found, uh, he proved why golf balls need to be doubled. Um, the whole idea that turbulence over a sphere is going to help it fly better than if it's not as well. Uh, so uh, he, he was involved in all kinds of stuff, the early NACA airports and stuff. And my grandmother was the original computer for the agency. And uh, her son, my dad, uh, was a mathematician and is still around and uh, taught math his entire career. All of his, his children are teachers. And uh, although I build a space station for a living, um, I get to come out and talk every now and then. So anyway, I come by it naturally. These two people, uh, they're in my blood, literally. And uh, that's how I got into the space for this. Um, there's my grandfather, by the way, standing with Edward Norton, who is in charge of flight testing. That's Orville Wright, and that's George Lewis from the Lewis Research Center of Spain. And I've always had this picture. Uh, that's the day they opened the doors of the first building. They were working out of tents until that point. So my grandfather and grandmother worked in tents until this building showed up. And I was actually riding the elevator with John Glenn the day that they announced that the Lewis Research Center was going to be the Glenn Research Center. And I'm kicking myself. I didn't ask him. Can you go up front and take a picture of my partner? <laughs> uh, he was a consummate gentleman, by the way. Uh, John Glenn, what a hero. Uh, it was a pleasure to have him around the agency, and he was all in on making it a success. Anyway, that's George Lewis for the second stand before him. 
Um, so let me talk a little bit about why we are in space, uh, what the big thing is about going. Um, we can get to the situation where gravity appears to go away by jumping out of an aircraft and just falling. And you've seen the view of skydivers floating in front of each other. Uh, and they can pass things back and forth. They'll send a camera, they'll send a hat, they'll, uh, they'll toss people back and forth. And it's effortless, although the wind is brushing by them, they appear to float right in front of each other all the way down until they pull their parachutes. Uh, what we do for short periods of free floating, like the gentleman is here holding the camera, there's an old picture, but it's the size of a video camera. Right? Remember those? <laughs> <laughs> you yourself um, we get an aircraft and we fly it like a cannonball being shot out of a cannon on a big parabolic trajectory. And once you get on that pure ballistic trajectory, it's as though you're falling up and falling down. And if you were launched inside the cannonball, you would feel this sensation of weightlessness all the time from when you left the barrel to when you hit the ground again. Uh, and so we do this effect. We get the airplane going as fast as it can possibly go sideways. And then we just turn it up and we go on the trajectory. And we go to where the wings are about to fall off. And so you go a couple of kilometers higher and you turn over and you come back down again. And of course, you'll be getting back up to the speed that was your maximum airframe speed when you get back to the level you came from. And so there you have to pull out and then you go off on the next trajectory. And so if you're riding inside this thing, you get 20 to 30 seconds of free fall inside. And you can do great experiments. Unfortunately, you also get 20 to 30 seconds of the plane turning around and coming back up. So you alternate in what I call conservation of grip g-force between zero and two g's and zero and two g's. You never see one g in there. Um, this plane has an interesting nickname, the Vomit Comet, because it's just so sick. And I have been aboard this for uh, four trips, and one of them was intentionally a higher g profile where we flew in big circles in the sky. Um, but three of them were zero g experiments, and I've been in zero gravity for half an hour of my life. And I can tell you an interesting find, which is that it hurts every bit as much to float into the wall at one meter a second as to walk into the wall at one meter a second. And that you are not massless, you are weightless. And that there, you become instantly aware of how ponderous your body is and how much damage you can do as a couple hundred kilo, hundred kilo person pushing off and hitting a wall. Uh, you can do some damage, which is why the astronauts are always just doing finger tip control. It's not that they're so diaphanous, it's because they don't want to hurt themselves. So anyway, a little, little back to wait for, for those of you who are thinking about a career in space. Um, so the problem with this is you get uh, 30 or 40 seconds uh, before you run out of zero G. Um, there is plenty of gravity all around you, by the way. You're always seeing the effect of giving into it and letting yourself free fall so it is not being countered by a force against it. So standing here on the floor right, and fighting gravity to take the floor away until I finally die hitting something else. I will be in zero gravity free, free fall. And Isaac Newton finally figured out how gravity and orbits and space are all related. Uh, and he said, look, let's build ourselves a tall tower and we'll fire the cannonball off and it will fall down range. And if I fire it faster, it'll go farther down range and continue this exercise until you finally go fast enough to where you come back to where you start from. Uh, and you can think about it this way, that if you are standing at the seashore and you see the horizon, then your eyes are going tangent to the edge of the earth out there. So it's eight kilometers away. Drop a quarter from your eye level. It takes a second to hit the ground. That's how much time you've got to get from where your eye is to the horizon you're looking at. So in one second, you have to get to what you are seeing on the edge of the ocean. That's really dang fast. That is 17 times the speed of a high speed rifle bullet. It is a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. Uh, and the problem is that you have to instill that energy into something you want to put into orbit, uh, or you have to take that energy out every time you come back down. And that energy is more than you typically see in any manufacturing process on Earth. And a hazard exists, for those of you who do safety work, a hazard exists every time you pass energy through anything of value to you. So lightning bolts hitting out the desert, you don't care. Lightning bolts hitting your puppy, you care. Does it, matter, does it matter to you? And there's energy going through it. That energy can be thermal, it can be electrical, it can be chemical, um, it can be kinetic, it can be any source of energy that you give to anything presents a hazard. And now we have to mitigate it. Well, the problem in space is we start out with ungodly amounts of energy. And then, oh, by the way, if you're going to be efficient, you say you're power managing, you're going to be working at higher voltages and higher currents because that's how you get efficient. And 
all of a sudden, and your rocket propellants are going to be the most explosive combinations of things you can put together per unit weight. And this gets to be a hazard when you go that far. Um, so once you close the orbit, if you decide to go even faster, you know, once you clear the wall, <laughs> you can go higher over the wall and you'll still come back down to the ground. Um, so the orbit gets to be elliptical. You will come back to where you started, but you start stretching the other side. And at some point, uh, you can go any direction you like. You can, in fact, break that ellipse and you can turn it into a, a parabola and you will leave the Earth gravity entirely if you can overcome what's called the terminal velocity of falling from deepest space to Earth. That's about 17 kilometers a second. Sorry, 11 kilometers a second. 17 kilometers a second for the sun. Um, so we, uh, it's the square root of two times whatever your minimum local orbital speed is, is your escape velocity. So we're dealing with tremendous speeds, and it takes a lot of energy to get there. Um, but once you're in the state of free fall, then we find that everything we know about biology, chemistry, and physics changes when we start to manipulate this gravitational field. And that's no big surprise, because we found that everything in our society changes when we uh, manipulate electricity, or magnetism, or radiation, or chemical balances, or heat, uh, or refrigeration. Um, as we move a typical force of nature and take control of it, we can make the world to do what we want it to do. And what we find is that there are effects that we hadn't really imagined that occur when we get rid of gravity. So flames, for instance, don't burn with a typical pointed shape and they don't suck oxygen in, they become a more diffusive thing, which tends to make more carbon nanotubes than other processes. You know, oh, that's cool. Make flames in space, you make carbon nanotubes. I had a friend that worked on making carbon nanotubes at NASA. And uh, he showed me the facility where they make these things in plasma arcs. And he said, okay, so we start with the carbon and we go through the process. And now we have to get rid of all the junk, you know, the graphite and the diamonds. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the diamonds are worthless, but the, the carbon nanotubes, that's what you're really going for. <laughs> I said, okay, it's all a question of perspective. Uh, but here, for instance, is Coca Cola, and the bubbles don't know how to leave the drop. They don't know how to go up, which is why we don't give carbonated beverages to our astronauts. Flatulence in space turns out to be a problem because the bubbles really don't know how to separate out and they just stay with you all the way through. So, carbonated beverages right out until you get to the moon or Mars. Um, but here's what happens if you take uh, a bubble drop and you give it a little bit of spin, all of a sudden you're making a bee. And the bubbles go to the middle and the water goes to the outside. None of this is what happens on Earth. So there's a bunch of, you can imagine, manufacturing processes that you might be able to start to manipulate by working in a zero gravity environment to start with. We could, for instance, make foam to metals, that sort of thing. Um, here's the plane. Uh, again, the carbon nanotubes coming out of the bottom. That's the uh, same basic fuel mix. Uh, this was actually taken on board Columbia. Uh, sad, but my friends were doing that kind of work. Um, this is protein crystal growth. Every disease of every plant and animal on Earth is the misfunction, malfunction, overfunction, underfunction of one or more proteins in your body or in the plant. And proteins are made of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, phosphates. Uh, and you put them together like little tinker toy blocks and you build different shapes. And those shapes, if you could crystallize it, you hit it with x rays, and the x rays make a very distinct pattern that depends on how the structure went together. But you need enough of this crystallized protein falling into a regular pattern so that you can get a meaningful x ray out of it. This is exactly how they discovered the structure of DNA. This is the process by which it was done. Um, and it turns out that one third of all the proteins that we know of on Earth cannot crystallize on the ground because the convective forces in the fluid are enough to take these very delicate diaphanous proteins and twist them around before they can crystallize and bond to another. So you're just out of luck trying to do crystallization of all these proteins on the ground. So we have a regular train of proteins going through the space station where we can grow them in zero gravity where there is no upper down, there is no buoyancy. And these very delicate proteins can grow to make things the size of the rings on the engagement ring, the uh, 50 diamonds on the engagement ring. If you get that big, now you can put it in the x-ray and then we can find out what's going on. Through that process, within the last three years, we figured out how salmonella does its dirty work in the human body. Uh, and so we were able to diagnose the path of, pathway of how this protein uh, causes the problem. So um, this kind of medical research is opened up by having zero gravity tool available for you. 
Um, here are some eutectic materials that by soldering, you might have sort of all blend together, but unfortunately they separate out by oil and vinegar uh, in some sets of materials. Uh, and it turns out when you can do it in zero G, you have a much better chance of them actually amalgamating into a new type of eutectic material. So uh, taking gravity away allows this sort of thing to do. This is a, a very powerful protector that you get back on the ground. Um, we find that microbes become more virulent in zero gravity, they become more acid resistant. We don't know why. Um, we find that the chromatin around DNA strands changes in certain microbes where they're bright yellow on the ground and clear in space, and we don't know why. Um, but we find that fundamentally these low level biological processes are changing, and it's really kind of nice to have a tool in your arsenal when you're trying to develop farming. Pharmaceuticals. So we think that pharmaceutical development is actually one of the key things that we'll be doing in space in the future. Um, we also find that the human immune system suppresses. We don't know why. Um, there's a lot of uh, similarities between zero gravity environment and aging, and that is why John Glenn volunteered for his mission. He said, we have seen for decades that when we send young, healthy people up, they come back showing signs of aging. What happens when you send a 77-year-old into space? What happens to his or her body? So he volunteered as a test subject, knowing full well it might do damage to his body. Um, the man is a national hero in so many ways, and uh, it's absolutely fascinating to work with him and see him work. Um, and now we've shattered shatter that record. <laughs> uh, you know, ironically, one of those people that went to space this year, he died just uh, last week or so in a crack accident. So, um, yeah, as I said, risky business. Uh, <laughs> this guy was apparently into taking risk all the time. So. Um, so when you decide to go to space, you start with an vacuum. There's nothing there. It is hostile. It is lethal. It's radiated the radiated environment. Uh, the temperatures range from liquid helium temperature, three degrees Kelvin, to boiling water temperatures or above, um, depending on whether you're facing the sun or not. Um, so radiation is going through you. It's hard vacuum. Uh, you can't breathe. Everything about it is hazardous. So now you have to create an environment for yourself that you can live in. So all of human spaceflight activity has been, let's go solve all those problems. So you start with an aluminum pressure hull. Uh, you make a, a skin, and like an aircraft, and you could pressurize the balloon if you stay inside that. Um, then you would need thermal protection because when you are facing deep space, remember that three degree Kelvin deep space temperature of the uh, Big Bang aftermath is all at three Kelvin. So you radiate, radiate out of the dark space and it's like soaking liquid gear. Then you turn around, you face the sun, and before your pass in front of Earth is over, you are above 100 Celsius. Right? So all you can do is put the crew inside a thermos bottle and try to keep the extremes of temperature from getting through. And uh, you'll find that uh, a lot of missions have to rotate the spacecraft to try to average what they're seeing in deep space and what they see at the sun. So thermal management is one of the biggest problems we have to overcome. The extremes are so far beyond the human experience. Um, that we need to insulate the daylights out and then do additional active thermal management. Um, then you need computers, radios, gyros, engines, all the stuff in your toaster, uh, everything you need to be a productive, happy person. That, of course, is going to take electricity. So you put solar cells on. Um, and so now you're generating all the power. Uh, and then you need to actually have some active thermal management because inside this thermal spot that you're running in, you're pumping all the power in to run your communications gear and your you know, microwave and stuff. And all of that is going to make you roast inside unless you can actually chill. So we have this amazing material, Z93, the zinc oxide material that is a bright white so that the sunlight, about two thirds of the energy of the sun is in the visible spectrum. Um, and then uh, it looks bright white to that part of the visible spectrum of the sun. And then it goes jet black in the infrared. So if you were to take an infrared picture of this, that part would be absolutely deep black. And it's radiating like crazy in the long range infrared. So that's how we take care of the heat projection on the spacecraft. We reflect the sun and we pump heat back towards the sun. In the deep space. Um, and that's part of the strategy of our flight staff, by the way, is really using a lot of that material on there. Um, so anyway, so this is typical of every spacecraft that you see. You're going to need a lot of all of this basic technology. It doesn't matter if you see it on the shuttle or uh, Elon Musk stuff or the Soyuz, they all have the same basic technology, same basic materials. So now you're going to go to space and you saw that little spacecraft and you can imagine that I'm going to build myself a rocket with a lot of infrastructure and it's going to hold some propellant 
and some tiny fraction of that infrastructure will make it to space as the payload. Uh, uh, throw away the boosters or if Elon Musk, you're going to recover the boosters and sell them back for a massive profit. Um, but you're going to throw away a lot of hardware and very little is actually going to make it to space. So then you're going to say, well, I need more. So I'm going to launch another one of those. I'm going to launch another one. I'm going to launch a few more. And then I'm going to launch hundreds of them. And I'm going to get the space business. And there's an idea that you do an economy of scale of production. And you say, I'll make a lot of cheap rockets. But then somebody else comes along and says, you know, if you have the tooling, why not just make one big rocket? And we'll get rid of all that infrastructure in the middle. And just the same way we build super tempers and skyscrapers and jumbo aircraft. Um, there is an economy in going bigger. And to the extent that you actually can make and hold together the thing you want to launch and get it from where you made it to where you're going to launch it, then it pays to build big. So then uh, all that stuff we took out of the middle turns into payloads. So for equivalent number of uh, propellant and a whole lot less hardware, you get more payload to work. But now you're dealing with big energetic systems that are a pain in the ass to work with. So for instance, here's the Russian proton rocket. The guy in the foreground is being projected back to as an extended mess to give you a sense of how big these are. I worked in the missile factory where these were made. Can you imagine seeing 13 of these lying on their side in what used to be an aircraft runway? Uh, the building is housing them, and they've got all of these on a production line, heading where they can launch five or six of them a year. And my spacecraft is the, uh, that black shroud up at the end. That's the moving band size payload at the end. But you get a, a sense of how difficult it must be to move that rocket from Moscow down to Baikonur. Uh, it turns out the roughest part of the ride for your payload is not the first stage, but the second stage or the orbital insertion or the navigation. It's the train ride going from Moscow to Baikonur. Those tracks are all. So just shaking the crap out of your pants. <laughs> so we learned that uh, the Russians were quite uh, honest about that. They said, and probably ought to protect the military. Um, if the shuttle the same thing, uh, you can see people next to our external tank. Uh, these things are absolutely enormous. Uh, so the infrastructure makes you feel tiny. But remember what I said about passing a lot of energy through things. When you decide you're going to launch a lot of it at a time, now you're releasing more power than the Hoover Dam. The, turbo pumps that ran the fuel injection into the main engines. So we're just talking about pumping fuel. That was equal to 17 diesel locomotives. Right? That's the kind of power those things were putting out. That's just to get the fuel in to light it off to do the real energy transfer. So um, the business of putting things into space turns into a large scale energy problem. Uh, can you notice the people in this picture? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, we are tiny compared to this creation. And yet, right down there, there's one of the brains that thought this up. And you think about the power of the human brain, which is 2% of the mass of your body. It is burning 20% of the oxygen and the glucose that your body delivers everywhere else. So it's consuming 10 times its share. And we are a species that advances because of this organ we have up here that is so different from any other species on the planet. Is what we use to manipulate the forces of nature. So when you see the relative side of the brains that put together something like this, you get a sense of leverage. Uh, and when you watch one of these things go, wow me. Um, solid rocket motors, they're burning two tons a second of dynamite equivalent. You're putting another two tons a second of liquid hydrogen to put oxygen together. You can drain a swimming pool in a minute uh, with one of these analytic pools. Um, and you're letting all that go. Those solid rocket motors are 150 feet long and they're, they've got holes on the inside. So they are essentially the world's largest organ pipe. You are now running your organ with two tons a second of dynamite exploding. It's resonating at six hertz, which is the frequency of a jackhammer. So the whole spacecraft feels like you're getting shaken by two tons a second of dynamite driving your, your jackhammer. And it's going to oscillate and undulate at six hertz, which you can't hear. But it's also going to undulate at 12 hertz and 18 hertz. And finally, you get to 36 hertz, which you can hear. And then you're going to get to uh, 40, 48 hertz, 42, 48. Every harmonic of six comes out. And what's cool is you get the fundamental harmonic of six hertz, and it starts moving across the ocean towards the spectators. And then all the other harmonics are beating many times for each six hertz blast comes out. The six hertz one has had most of the energy 
and all the others start adding up. For those of you who have done Fourier transforms, go through the mental exercise of adding all the harmonics together of one frequency. And what you end up with is a square wave at that frequency. So instead of hearing the wall, 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 six hertz when you're miles away, what you get is of a square wave of all the pressure that has come out over the last one sixth of a second from each of the solid rocket motors, which by the way are now tuned to each other like tuning forks, and they are blasting now four tons a second of dynamite in a square wave acoustic wave that hits you, and your clothes start to flap, and your ears start to thud, and your hair starts to move. So now you watch the light of those solid rocket motors compete with the sun as it goes up, and then you see it reflected off the ocean. And now you have three suns, and your clothes are shaking, the ground is shaking. It is as close to a man made religious experience as you can get. We did this 135 times with the shuttle. Now we're building a bigger rocket, right? <laughs> so the bigger rocket <laughs> is even bigger than the Saturn V, and it's there to get us to the moon. Um, there is some thought that maybe we've overstretched. That maybe we ought to be launching a bunch of smaller rockets and rendezvousing in orbit. You know, if that's another strategy, we shall see. The first test flight of the Artemis One, the space launch system, is coming in February. Um, it is a massive rocket, and the solids are even bigger than we have on the shuttle, so they're going to make an even louder, lower frequency noise. So we'll have more time to integrate up that is it five hertz, where they're going to run at. Um, and now you'll get that square away hitting with even more energy and break it up, and he will literally get it blasted away from the south of this thing. So um, this is what humans do. This is what your space agency does to try to get us out to where we can live in space, to take advantage of this microgravity environment. But oh, by the way, one asteroid, so tiny that it orbits around another asteroid, little Ida going around the actual Earth. That's more iron and nickel than Earth has ever mined. So if you can go out and gather your iron, nickel, aluminum, titanium somewhere other than the surface of the Earth and do your polluting out there, maybe we've got a brighter future on the ground. So while it's expensive, we don't know yet. We're evolving what we can do in space. We've never been in space when I was a kid. Um, now we're at a point where we're permanently there. We've been there for 21 years on the space station. Uh, and we're starting to evolve the science of what we can do. And this rocket, is our next big thing that we as an agency can do. We're about to turn the keys over to lower Earth orbit to the private sector. In the same way that my grandparents in North Dakota worked on designing aircraft. Okay, so it was all experimental back then, but I took Delta Airlines coming up here. I bought a ticket. And when we need to go to lower Earth orbit, we'll buy a ticket. And by the time your grandkids are coming along, maybe we'll buy a ticket to live on the moon. Um, and we don't have to do it as an agency. NASA will be trying to do the next big thing. Um, all of this takes risk. Uh, and we have a standard process. I hope you're learning risk management as part of your engineering practices. When you start taking on public welfare, the, the lives of your friends, you must calculate what are the chances that we will have a problem and what are the consequences if that problem comes up. So we categorize every single possible happenstance that we can imagine in the program. We work to see what are the consequences if it happens. We have backup, you know, is it immediately uh, lethal to the group? Is it just a nuisance? How much time does it take to fix? How long are we going to be down? What does it preclude us from doing? So we measure the consequence, we measure the likelihood, and everything gets in a box on this kind of grid, every single facet of the space program. And when you get up into the red up there, it says it's a reasonably high probability of happening, and it's a bad day if it does, then the program starts spending money saying, okay, let's go re engineer that, rethink it. And communicating risk is the most important way to talk amongst the different subsystems of the space program. So it, it doesn't matter if you're doing propulsion or life sciences or communications, you need to get accurately uh, put on this chart. So you, if you're a three by three, you better know that you're a three by three and not masquerading as a higher risk than a one by one. You need to be honest. And then the program manager is gonna start spending his or her reserves to try to fix what's in the red zone. We've worked for 30 years this way, and unfortunately, sometimes what's in the red zone still comes back and gets you. It turns out that the number one risk on space station here, way up here, is what I've been asked to work on, the orbital debris program office. Orbital debris hitting the space station is the number one thing that's going to kill that program, and we don't know what to do about it, except 
try and negotiate with all the world powers, but please don't make more than three because we can't see it coming and it will kill us. So, um, so the things that we can do about it, uh, if it is a dangerous thing, um, like lighting off a solid rocket motor on a shovel or the new SLS, if you light one of them and only one of them, it's an exceptionally bad day. Right? You have to have them go as the pair, launching exactly at the right time, every time, guaranteed. How many people have not been to a hardware store in the last five years? Yeah, things break. Switches, valves, things fundamentally break, especially if you operate in uh, the Kennedy Space Center there by the Florida seacoast with hurricanes coming through and salt water and birds moving on stuff. And things break. You just have to accept it. Nothing is 100% reliable. So imagine if you've got a circuit here that's going to light off a solid rocket motor, and you absolutely positively have to guarantee that it doesn't short out the switch and fire it too early. Absolutely guarantee it doesn't happen. You say, well, I'm going to have three independent switches along any path here, and I have to close all three of them in order to make this thing work. Right? And then the safety guys say, okay, great. You kept it from firing accidentally. Now you guarantee you actually have to fire two of them at once. They must go together. So you absolutely positively have to succeed when you fire them. Say, well, I'll do three of these in parallel. So any one of these paths will work. Well, then you start counting up the switches. And the safety guys get to come in and say, I get to break this system in any two places I choose. You have to be too failure to power. And it doesn't matter. You, they're going to come in. They're going to play this tic-tac-toe -tac game. They're going to look at your system. They get really good at this. So I'm going to blow this valve. And I'm going to blow this switch. See if you can survive. And when you do, now you've got a circuit that looks like this. That's on each of the solid rocket motors. And so now you have nine switches on each motor. So there's 18 switches. Oh, by the way, you have to know the condition of the switch. So there's a sensor on the switch. So now you have 18 sensors and a total of 36 components to do one job, which is to light those engines together. 36 of them. STS 51 was getting ready to launch and they had one switch fail closed 42 seconds before launch. You are the flight director, what do you do? You scrub finish. You go back and you fix this system because in the next 42 seconds, you're now, if you get two more failures along this line, you're telling everybody on the back. And the rule is two failure tolerant, right? Until the mission is running. <laughs> if the mission's flying, you don't get to turn around. But if you have a choice, you stop. So that's the game we play when we're dealing with all this energy. That's what makes the space program so expensive. Right? So now you have to ask you know, can we make it less expensive by doing more reliable, shorter, smaller rockets? Can we do it by using solid state components? What can we do? Um, and we are always playing that game and we invented the science. Um, it turns out that we weren't ready to trust network communications uh, and getting over uh, internet. And building the shovel, and so everything was hardwired. And so there is seven miles of copper cable going into the flight deck of the shovel endeavor. All the copper, it took, all those people will lift the copper and put it in. We had to launch that every time. So some of that payload we got, uh, right, was really big. Well, <laughs> the redundancy ate up a lot of that mass. Um, so what can you do in your design? Well, if you're building, say, the external tank, or let's say you're taking a coat hanger in space, and your coat hanger is said, well, I wanted to carry a couple of suits, two shirts, some ties, and my pajamas, right? I'll hang it all on there, and I've got a big stubby piece of steel. And they say, okay, well, that's what the theory says it should do with any margin that you could get out there if you were that good, if the steel was excellent and you had really tight quality control on the diameter and you didn't shake the coat hanger too much, it might in theory hold on everything. But in reality, you don't know how good the steel is. So you're going to end up on this line, the design limit, plus or minus the rust and corrosion and mix that you get and any disturbance. And then you got to be sure that you don't get out to the edge of what you actually trust. So you're going to qualify it and say, well, I prefer you only to hang two shirts and a tie on it. And by the time you're done between the certification and the operating limits and everybody's keeping a little bit more margin, you're going to end up operating it where you only carry one tie on this piece of steel, unless, unless your quality assurance is so good that you can get all of those limits right next to each other. 
It's like, I know for a fact that there are no inclusions in the steel. I know for a fact that it is milled to exactly 1.331 plus or minus 0 0.001 millimeters that I measured that and I'm sure of it, right? Well, you can do that. And now you can carry everything you want to do on that foot hanger, but all that paper is going to cost you an awful lot of money, right? So the quality assurance to use the materials to the edge of what you can possibly do means that you have to track it from the time it came out of the ground to where it flies in space. You need to have the heritage of it and somebody had to be tracking it. And that's part of why when we're trying to build these big projects and you need to be at the edge of performance, we end up paying for it. Now we worked with Alcoa to develop the new aluminum that we made the external tank from by adding lithium to it. We had to develop the stir welding technique, which is now standard in aerospace to work with this very brittle material but it took 600 pounds out of the external tank, which turned into paper. And once we worked with Alcoa on the process controls to guarantee that we were getting the same mix every time, now they can sell it to Boeing and they can sell it to everybody else. And we reinvented aerospace aluminum. Um, and we now trust the company to keep the quality assurance in there because all the customers need that kind of QA. So having spent all the development the money up front to do the testing and development and process certification, now we get to, to reap the benefits every time we fly. Um, you can cut the margins too tight. So the Europeans provided the solar arrays for the Hubble Space Telescope. There it is launching. And you notice already that the sun is starting to warp the array. See how it twists? The structure wasn't quite prepared for the thermal limit that it was going to see. And so whenever the array warped and turned back, it changed where the Hubble Telescope was pointing. We had to wait for everything to settle down because the solar arrays were wobbling too much. So the next time we went up to service the solar arrays, we got higher tech silicon, <laughs> Gally Marshall had it, and we put it on a big structural panel and we changed it out. This is what happens when you design too close to the margins, you start to fail. Um, so we use lightweight materials. We're constantly looking for taking the weight out, getting the strength up, doing whatever we can to get increased performance because that energy penalty to get things to orbit is just too difficult. So we're looking for lightweight materials. Uh, this aerogel is. Uh, silica fiber that is all just lightly joined together. It is essentially the shovel pile material that over here is dense. Uh, and it's very, very diaphanous lattice that it's really hard to move gases or anything through it. Um, so because it's quartz, it doesn't melt even at high temperature. So you can get one surface white hot and uh, you can touch the other side, nothing happens. The other thing is you can impregnate it with helium and so much it will just float. You see, it's the only solid in the world that will float. Um, so inflating structures, uh, I saw, uh, you, you showed me the inflating uh, parabolic mirror, uh, reflecting mirror. Um, we played around with a bunch of inflating structures. We had one on the space station and I suspect this is our future that we won't inflate. But turns out that these are remarkably micrometeorite uh, proof that the way you build these, there's enough foam that sits between the outer Kevlar layer and the inner bladder that is really good at slowing down the orbital Really like puncture aluminum. So if you get enough porous material in between, it turns out to be really, really good at stopping these 10 kilometer a second particles. Um, here's a, a reflecting dish that we tried in space. And the problem is we had a pinhole in here. And after they got this big tennis court size dish going on STS 7, then we had um, the pinhole leak just started to tumble this whole thing and they lost. The bus that it was carrying and the whole thing started to come. I had to get out of Dodge, get out of the way. Um, so, one tiny little error, and all the energy stored up in that pressurized gas led to a hazard. So, uh, that first step is a doozy getting there. We, I think you guys probably know about rocket propulsion. Um, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. You can throw a brick off the back of a little cart and you go farther. Um, you can throw springs instead of wasting your arm. You can store the energy in spring and let it push itself off. It doesn't care what the mass is springs, bricks, feathers, it doesn't matter. Throw the mass off the back at a given momentum, and you get the equal and opposite momentum in the other direction. So you can imagine we store the energy in the material that we're throwing off the back, and that gives you energy, but you don't have to you know, waste your arm doing. So you say, well, how much energy could I get in what I throw off the back? And somebody says, well, we could throw dynamite. 
the problem with dynamite is now what do you do with it? It all blows up. <laughs> what does that do for you? So we put a parabolic dish around it. We put our explosives in there. We use the chemical energy uh, to allow this stuff to then focus out the back, and then we really take off. And the problem with that is if you go get the most energy per unit mass of the stuff that we put together, you end up with hydrogen and oxygen. And the problem with that is that hydrogen is such a light material that you can't get enough mass out the back fast enough. You can't pump those engines any faster to get the hydrogen and oxygen mixing together to get enough thrust to get going. There's not enough mass going out the back. So you've got your, your bricks sitting here and gravity is holding it down at 9.82 meters per second squared. And you need to throw an awful lot of dynamite out the back. And so what we figured out to do was we don't have to be as efficient at getting out. We just have to get more mass out the back. So instead of throwing hydrogen and oxygen, we throw dynamite. We literally, our solid rocket motors, we can keep that iron mixed in with it. So the iron is adding to the incredible density of stuff coming out the back. Not terribly efficient. You do this only to fight gravity and get going. Then you dump those suckers as fast as you can. Big steel casings, it's all very heavy, but it's really efficient without using a pump at getting a lot of stuff out the back. So when you throw enough dynamite out the back, you get going. And so you'll find that modern rocketry uses, unless you're Elon, who's rethinking the whole process here, quite effective. But traditionally, over the last 20, 30 years, everybody has put these solid rocket motors on the side. You light the sustainer core because you get some added help by taking one big tank, burning liquid and hydrogen and oxygen out of that, as we did with the shovel. We got up those engines at launch and we light the solids and off we go. So everybody's putting solids on the side. But when you get to space, why rely on chemistry when you've got all that sunlight around? So the evolving rocket technology is to use electric propulsion in one way or another. Hall effect engines that use magnetic fields on the ionized gas. Uh, arc jet engines, or even the Vasimir rocket, which uses radio frequency to heat the plasma um, to great effect. Now, the performance of the rocket, which is measured in the number of seconds that a kilogram of material can hold itself against gravitational force, so take any unit of mass, how many seconds can it sit there holding itself against gravity in terms of the total thrust times time? And it may be that it's really, really low thrust, but you integrate that up and typical solid rocket motors, 200 seconds. Liquid engines, uh, hyperbolic well, fuels, 300 some seconds. Liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, 420 seconds. The Vasimir rocket, 27,000 seconds. Right. <laughs> when you use somebody else's energy to accelerate it, there's almost no limit as to how fast you can get it going using electromagnetic fields. And so if you aren't in a terrible hurry to go anywhere, then these new electric engines are where you want to go. The new Chinese space station, all of its reboots just now being new, done with these electric engines. I had a big task on the International Space Station, you know, too late, too smart. If we could put these electric engines on it, we would have had to rewire the entire power system to drive it, but we would have only had to send one propeller delivery every three years to reboot the station that way. Right at the moment, we're delivering it four times a year. So, you know, go figure. <laughs> too late with it. Too late, too soon, old, too late, smart. Um, so there's the mirror, and you can see it was built out of a cluster of things, uh, which were each launched individually on uh, rockets and then navigated their way over these Winnebago's that got together. Um, we experimented on shovels in the 1970s, 1980s, sorry, 1980s, 90s, um, working on building structures in space so that we could actually make large scale things uh, instead of having to launch them intact from the ground. Um, and we ultimately figured out that we could break the station into chunks that could be assembled in space. They didn't have to be self-contained. Uh, the mirror, each of those vehicles has its own solar arrays, its own thermal radiators, its own thrusters. Uh, so again, it's a, a, an assembly of Winnebago's in space. Um, so what we did was we said, let's, let's have the trucks bring the cargo, we'll put the cargo together, we'll build a skyscraper that is not made out of Winnebago's or delivery trucks. It'll be a skyscraper. So that's what we chose to do. And you'll notice the red side over there, the Russian side is still using the older technology. So they have brought vehicles up that are still 80% of the truck that gets there. Uh, it works well for them, and it's not as efficient as what we've done. 
Um, so we learned how to build big structures that, you know, it's structure and we needed robotic arms to pull it together in space and build this giant spacecraft. So over the years, we've learned how to assemble large things in orbit, which is sort of counter to what the big Artemis uh, SLS rocket is doing. Competing strategies of just how big a rocket we need to do. Um, Congress gave a lot of input into what we were going to do. Meanwhile, Elon is doing other things. Uh, Bezos is doing other things. The Russians are doing other things. And we'll find the right answer. And it may be that this is a brilliant stroke, maybe a wrong turn. I don't know. Uh, but that's the joy of being in an engineering career. Um, so that piece ends up in a bigger structure, and that leads to something the size of a football stadium that has been over your head for the last few years. Um, we've had people aboard it for 21 years. So we built a really reliable structure. Part of what I do in my day-to-day -day life is plan for how do we get rid of this thing? Where are we going to drop it? And we can't send it to a higher orbit. We can't leave solar system. It would take more propellant than we've ever sent to it to do something other than just come back down to Earth and trying to avoid hitting people with this thing is going to be tough. Um, but uh, it, we've had an amazing amount of experience. We spent uh, a couple of orders of magnitude more time spacewalking on the space station than everything we did on the moon and jet and all prior uh, activities. We had to build special facilities trained to build the space station. Just in the US alone, we have 520 facilities that were dedicated specially to designing and building the space station. Around the world, our colleagues have another 500. This is the largest engineering achievement in the history of mankind. And so we hope that it's all been worth the effort. But let me show you another picture. Uh, here we are launching from Baikonur. Um, Baikonur is next to the RLC, which is magnified over here. You notice something missing in the RLC, like all of its water that was there when we started the space program. All of its water is coming from the Tibetan plateau in here. The Tibetan plateau feeds over into Kazakhstan, but it also feeds the Indus and the Ganges River and the Mekong and the Yellow and the Yangtze and 45% of the world's population gets their water from the Tibetan plateau, 25% of which has vanished in my lifetime. And it leads to regular flooding of these rivers but the worst of it is that it may go away completely in our lifetimes, at which point 45% of the world's population is going to be looking for some new way to get fresh water. You can imagine the problems that that is going to cause. Um, so just understanding the environmental impact of what's been happening in our lives and the perspective we get from space has caused a lot of us to think about what else can we do with all this technology that we've been developing. So here's some shots of a trip I took to Rwanda. We were working with this team to do fruit drying, where they had an orphanage. They wanted to dry the fruit, sell it in Europe. Um, and this is the, you can see the steepness of the slope they're on. They were taking the challenge to build this into an orchard, but we took on the Engineers Without Borders job to build them efficient dryers for the fruit. And trying to figure out how to do that led to uh, all kinds of engineering successes, including biogas digestion. But before we started that, our contact with them was providing fresh water. And Dr. Evan Thomas here um, was one of the original members of the first Engineers Without Borders chapter that's a student in Colorado under Bernard Amade, who started this entire structure. I don't know if you have an Engineers Without Borders group in the Well, if you don't, start one. Uh, it's an amazing place to go sharpen your skills. And Evan worked on our water purification system, and he said, hey, wait a minute. There's stuff that we can do in developing countries that wouldn't take much technology at all. And he's dealing with the highest tech part of the whole system. That is an ultraviolet light in the UVC band, where if you put ultraviolet light on any microorganism, virus, whatever, it is going to take the thionines in the ATCG group, every T, it's going to tie it to another T permanently in a way that cannot unzip the DNA. So you start with Ebola and the UVC light turns it into Gatorade, right? Doesn't matter what it used to be able to do to you. It is non-functional. It is dead, gone to the great beyond, gone to meet its maker. It is not coming back if you hit it with UVC light. And recently, uh, everybody's been sort of learning to adapt that technology. You can buy LEDs now that will do that. You'll find that this becomes the basis of our water purification 
and air purification get these things just taking your air guns. Evan learned about this technology early on and said, if we put that on reasonably clean water, we can kill every microbe in it. We can solar power this little light and it will keep it absolutely safe drinking. Now, how do we get the water clean? Well, they said, well, you can do a rapid sand filter like we do on our pools. And he developed something called the bring your own water technology. There's been some papers published on this where villagers are always used to carrying their buckets of water to their house. If they stop off and drop it into the sand filter, we're going to take less than 5% of the water they put in and send it over to another barrel, which every couple of days, we're going to backwash the sand filter and clean it. If you do it right, you never have to change the sand again. So for a 5% water tax, we keep the sand filter going forever. Then the ultraviolet light is powered by a solar cell. That light is good for 15 years we put a new bulb in. It costs you a thousand bucks to build this. You are now purifying the water for a village. And we said, okay, now what I have to do is copy this a few hundred times over. Enter Ron Guerin and Nicole Stott, two of our astronauts, who said, we want to help. So they got connected with the UN. Nicole's husband was born in the Isle of Man and carried that certificate. Conveniently, the Isle of Man was part of the World Climate Accords that said we're going to trade in carbon credits that are going to be administered by the UN. So Nicole and her husband and Ron Guerin and his wife went to the UN and said, we think that we could provide fresh water to everybody in Eastern Africa. We're going to set up a factory to do exactly what Dr. Thomas is illustrating here. We're going to go get carbon credit futures. We need the UN to allow us to sell a future on generating carbon credit so we can get the money and build these water systems. They got the Swiss Energy Corporation to buy every one of the UN carbon credit futures that they were allowed to sell. They used it to build a factory, build the water systems across Rwanda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Not bad, right? That's what astronauts do in their spare time. That's what rocket scientists do with their spare time. So um, then in the fruit drying side, we got involved in biogas digestion. And we said, you know, when we've colonized moon and Mars, Biogas ain't a bad idea for how to deal with all the biological waste we're going to have. We can create methane from that. We can do Sabatier processes. We can do a bunch of things, but we can also generate clean fertilizer and we will handle the sewage problem. The only problem is we don't know how that works in zero gravity or in the 160 year lunar gravity or Martian gravity. So we were busy building a biogas digester like the big one you see here for our project in Rwanda. And we actually got a grant to go look at this intestine looking thing here where we could tilt these long pipes at very shallow angles and simulate what would happen in plus six G or uh, one third G and by having them be very shallow and just tilt them slightly and say that's low low gravity gradient you're going to see. And so NASA helped fund some of our biogas research for going into the planet. Um, just a hint of what we get to do. So yeah, my career was building high-tech spacecraft, working with Russians. That opened my eyes to making a change in the world. And the Rwandans and the Kenyans have nothing to do with the space station, but they have everything to do with life on Earth. If we dry up their water supply, or if we pollute it, or if we you know, denude the planet, or we get their temperatures too high because of our carbon footprint, um, it all matters. And so everything we're doing in space, the perspective we're getting from it, the technologies we're learning, it's not just about building a better world out there. It is about building a better world down here. And our astronauts, our engineers, our entire being is committed to making life better. So you may not see it all the time when you watch the space launches, but I guarantee you, our hearts are here. And that's what we're trying to do. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll take questions. I think I probably used my out. Uh, those of you on the web, if you have questions, relay them in and that's good. Uh, and it's in my blood. My grandmother passed it on to me. And, uh, she was a, a pioneer, and she, uh, she and Pearl Young, first two women in the agency, and they came from here. They founded the place. So imagine what you can do when you head on out in the world. Questions? Yes. Um, some have said that uh, the, the government should just get out of the way with certain parts of, of space flight that commercial space should take over. 
and that you talk about the cost of doing safety assurances and quality assurances and the level of redundancy. Do you see a conflict with commercial space enterprises not putting as much uh, money into the same safety assurances that okay. you uh, Yeah, the question for those on the web may not appear to heard it is uh, the relative concentration on safety versus profit acceleration and motivation between what the government does and what uh, commercial space does. Uh, first of all, when we were going to the moon, we expected that we were going to fail and learn some hard lessons. And the government let us because we were in a race and Apollo 1 came and you know we had to press on. Um, whereas since then, the, our sponsors in Congress really don't want us to fail in public anymore. We're a government agency and we did our big mission. And so now they want bold things, but they do not want us to fail. And funding gets cut and programs get stopped if we fail again. Um, we had a test rocket that was doing the kind of landing that Elon's doing, uh, the Delta Clipper. Uh, and it was all going to be carbon fiber. And we failed the first prototype of it. And then the entire program was canceled, even though it had every evidence that it was going to be able to do what Musk was doing 35 years before he did it. So we weren't allowed to fail. Elon is busy. Landing his boosters, he dropped them in the ocean to start with and tried to soft land a few, and that failed. And then he finally succeeded, and now he's landing them all. Uh, but he intentionally let himself fail a lot so he could learn the lessons. So we think that the two paths to safety, he's learning his lessons, but we see the very visible failures along the way. We have a failure and we shut down forever. Uh, God help us if the Artemis One mission had a problem, he may never get off the planet again. Um, so we do have oversight over what they do, and we have to decide, is it safe enough for us? Um, and our crew have you know, every boat in that. They're part of the safety acceptance. Um, and they're really, really getting on board these things and why. Uh, Elon's ejection capability uh, to save the capsule, it's better than we had on Apollo. You know? <laughs> it's a not bad system. So if the rocket blows up, he's good. Uh, he recently figured out, by the way, they had an explosion of an upper stage carrying a cargo mission to the station. And he realized we didn't have a good ejection system for the capsule carrying the cargo. So he said, let's do that. And he lost the whole cargo that he could have you know, landed safely. Uh, so he learned from his mistake. It wasn't his mistake, by the way. One of the, the contractors that delivered some struts to hold the hydrogen tank in place. They delivered faulty goods. They said, yep, we guarantee it's 1.333 millimeters thick and it was 1.21 millimeters thick, and it didn't hold the launch loads. And they were saving money by just checking them off, saying, yep, they said it was good. Now he's learned there's a little bit more paper to spend on all of the assurance, but probably not as much as NASA spends. He's just going to fire that contractor. If you want to do business with Elon, you better damn well do the right thing because he, he owns the space launch business now. And if he says you're out, where you go sell. So there's a natural incentive for people to do it right. We've learned a lot of hard lessons. So unfortunately, we have some of the anachronistic regulations that keep us from really thriving. So in some ways, it's really good to let somebody else take the risk. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Um, are more commercial companies focusing on near Earth or the space? Systems. Yeah, the question is uh, commercial systems are focusing on low Earth orbit, uh, near Earth. Yeah. Has yeah. Um, there been any commercial endeavors focusing on space debris cleanup? Or yes. Uh, Astroscale is a company based in Japan that is building their entire business model out of not only servicing the large mega constellations, saying if you fail in orbit, we can come get you and get you out of orbit, but they will concurrently also be working on getting other derelict objects out. Um, and there's an evolving uh, program, not so much that we're involved in the Orbital Debris Program Office, because we don't get involved in the space operations side. We're more concerned about just not making debris. But there is a body of work going on to standardize the targeting and the grappling. And what can you do on your spacecraft for next to no mass that will make it easier for somebody to get you later? A lot of the big, really good ideas have to do with sticking your probe up the engine and grabbing it that way. Uh, there's a bunch of ways that you can grab standard CubeSats and things. So, and people are working on that. Um, so the, the cleanup is actually something we know has to happen. A lot of models said the Kessler syndrome, for Don Kessler, who founded my office, 
Um, he predicted that if you get this kind of runaway of space for three, then most people believe we're probably already there with a half life of about 75 years. So it'll double if we launch nothing further, you'll have more debris 75 years from now than you have now. Um, is that a problem? Well, we still have very few collisions in space. We do have satellites that are knocked out of commission, but not necessarily exploded, but it's coming. Uh, so yeah, active debris removal, not responsibility in my office, but I'm pleased to see that it's evolving. And there are private companies, uh, Deorbit Corporation, Astroscale, and there's some others that are trying to make that a commercial go. Question is, who's going to pay for it? If you have a derelict satellite, you're going to pay to get that, then you just got to walk away. It's your letter to it. <laughs> um, anything else? Well, thank you very, very much for hosting me here. Uh, it is really amazing to be walking with my grandmother about her education. I know she made a difference in our world. Uh, I know it started here in North Dakota. Uh, what an honor to come back and be part of where she started. And uh, thank you for letting me share my experience in space. I hope it inspired you. So, thank you. Hey, thank you, Dr. Bacon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, both, both online and in person. Take care and have safe travels back to where you're going.